Hello and welcome back to Foos Entertainment. This time for my um, unveiling of this box set right here. Star Trek Next Generation. Complete motion picture box set. Now this one um, is the original release as well. Which why I mentioned that is because these box sets have been re-released in different calvers all over the place in the past few years. This one's actually starting to wear off. Like the title right here is actually, for example, is starting to wear off in, in this area, as you can see. It's much like the original series of one. Um, you have the plastic case on the top with the hologram it's ground in the middle right here. And you have the back art in it remains as you can see and of course they're just slim blu-ray cases for each movie with each um, case containing a character from the NC-1701 D and E crew commanded by John Luke Picard Well, let's talk about the first one. After the um, cancellation of the TV series Star Trek Next Generation, they went into work on making the first motion picture film. Now, they still all obviously had the original series films that were still very popular, so they did something very smart. They tied in to the original films. By actually having Captain Sp Captain um, Kirk, and this right here is actually when I mean, you have to pay very close attention to see this Captain Montgomery Scott in Commander Chekhov. Now you actually have to look very closely to see that um, the uh, rank and insignia on Scotty is actually that of a captain. But if you pay attention, you'll notice that. And of course, integrating it in with the next generation for sort of a time travel type of thing. Have to do it with our main story of the film. Star Trek Generations is certainly not my favorite Star Trek movie, but it does have a lot of very, very good gems that I like about the movie. Like, for example, um, I think that Malcolm McDowell did a wonderful job playing the villain in this movie. You can, he, he's one of the best villains of Star Trek history, is. Um, Sauron, in which um, Michael McDowell plays in, in this movie, is one of the best villains of all time in Star Trek. And of course, there's also the, um, the humor of Commander Data. Actually, take back Lieutenant Commander Data, because he's not a commander in this movie. He's a Lieutenant Commander. But um, the Lieutenant Commander Data's Humor was also very um, much of a gem in this movie that I liked. But where the movie falls short for me is the fact that uh, it spends too much time on story and not enough time on excitement, and it's too commercial in my opinion. I also didn't like how they uh, did transference from the original series crew to Next Generation and making Kirk a very vulnerable and very... Um, clumsy <laughs> version of him, of his formal self. Granted, he still is James T. Kirk and still saves the day and stuff like that. He actually dies twice in the movie. Dies at the beginning of the film, saving the day, and then dies at the very end of the movie, saving the day. So he, Kirk has the luxury of dying twice. And um, originally when he did die, yeah, he did die alone like he said in Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, but when he died for real, the second time around, he, um, he actually really wasn't alone. He was actually uh, accompanied by um, Picard in his passing. But, um, yeah, um, there's just some things about the movie I just do not like. That 
the that'd be one of them. Kirk is kind of not the badass that we all know him to be in this movie. He's he's very heroic and very tough and and very very much our superhero of the of the previous six movies. And then he's vulnerable, clumsy, old, and pathetic in this one. And that right there is a big turnoff to me. Sorry, but it is. Picard, on the other hand, I actually like Picard in this movie because of the fact that if you actually watch um, select episodes of Star Trek Next Generation, you will find out that Picard can actually throw punches and be an action hero when he is required to do so. But what's really cool about this movie is he's like an action hero the entire movie. He's tough as, as, he's tough as Nels in this movie. He does a lot of the action stuff in this movie. He's like the action hero. And that's obviously the case of the next films in the next generation um, segments of the film series. First Contact, Next Direction, and Nemesis. He gets more and more of an action hero with, with each one. And I really do like that because Picard's been kind of known as the opposite of Kirk in the, the, in the, in the Star Trek series, The Next Generation, versus the original series. Kirk was always throwing punches, fighting bad guys. Well, Picard was more intellectable. He sat back behind him in the lines, directing everything instead of actually being a part of the action. He left that up to Riker all the time. In this movie, um, as well as all the other films, he's more of an action hero, which I really like. It's very refreshing. Well, let's go on to the premise of the film and make this pretty quick. Um, because I got to get to work. The simple premise of the movie. Um, when the Enterprise B which um, takes place in between, because there's four ships that were actually in the 23rd century. The NC-1701, the NC, sorry, the NCC-1701 Alpha, the NCC-1701 Beta, and um, the NC-1701C, which I guess would be Charlie. Um, those were all in the 23rd century. Obviously, it was a Federation battle cruiser for... Um, the first two, the third, which is Beta, that one was um, a um, Excelsior transport drive ship. And of course, it was a medical cruiser when it comes to Charlie, which is the NCC 1701C, which is um, shown in an episode of Star Trek Next Generation in season three, I believe, or might have been four. Um, <clears throat> Kirk, Scotty, and Chekhov are on, a, on this sort of send-away celebration of the unveiling of the NCC-1701 Beta USS Enterprise. When they are called by the stress signal, and they go and they discover this mysterious energy ribbon that is destroying ships. And they try to save people, and one ship gets destroyed, they beam about 47 out of 150 people out of the other ship. They get caught in the ribbon and about to get destroyed. And Kirk has to find some way to, uh, to get to where they can create a substitute torpedo blast into the heart of the ribbon to break free from his, from his um, gravimetric force. And in doing so, the hall that he was in gives away and he gets sucked out into space and killed. 80, 80 years later, the same Riven is making anomalies in space and the USS Enterprise NCC 1701D, whatever D stands for, I haven't quite figured out one out. I think it's Delta. <laughs> and basically, um, Picard and his crew are called to a, this this um, space research station and find out the Rovellans were after something called Trilithium. And they come across this mysterious scientist by the name of Dr. Sarin, who was our villain in the movie, played brilliantly by Malcolm McDowell. And basically, uh, he's behind it all. He, he wants to get back to this ribbon because supposedly this ribbon is a gateway to a supernatural nether world known as the Nexus. And uh, he wants to get back to it. He don't care what it costs. 
R of him getting back to it. And his um, plan, basically, is to go to a very inhabited galaxy known as, Berni known as the Beridium Galaxy, in which one of the planets actually has quite a few million people on it. And how he wants to, to get to the ribbon is he wants to deflect the course of this energy ribbon to him by blowing up the galaxy. By saying that 12 wave shock wave, level 12 shock wave, um, which would destroy every planet within the galaxy like a supernova would. So he can deflect the um, ribbon to come to him. So he can, he can be captured by his, his need for enlightenment paradise that this ribbon provides for his supernatural netherworld. And uh, of course, Picard and his crew had to stop him. They fell. Picard gets thrown into a nexus, and that's where he discovers Kirk, who has been captured by the mysterious supernatural principles of the of this Riven, and has been trapped in his own personal paradise. And he has to convince Kirk to help him to go back into time before the Reno Galaxy is destroyed, and to face Doctor Sarin in pretty much save the galaxy. And in doing so, um, they do stop Dr. Sarin, and Kirk is impelled from a, from, a, from a bridge of sorts, and, well, he dies with some nice good last words to Picard, and then gets buried, and no one even knows he's there. And of course, the NC-1701D is destroyed, which means we get a brand new USS Enterprise in the next movie. That's pretty much the um, premise of the film. Audio and video quality. This one is very nostalgic 1994 looking movie. Just like the last movie was a very nostalgic 1991 looking movie. It seems that Star Trek 6 Undiscovered Country and Star Trek Generations look as if they were made of their time when it comes to, um, to movie technology. <laughs> Which is unfortunate. Because they didn't have to do it that way, but like I said, I'm, not, I'm actually a fan of films looking like that. Look, looking the way they're supposed to look based on what they had at the time they made them. But it, like I said before, it's just very annoying when you have one movie that looks like it was made today with high definition all that stuff. And you have a movie that's remastered and restored in high definition, but it looks like it was made all those years ago. And that's kind of the case with Star Trek 2... Star Trek 6 in, well, Star Trek 7, which is Generations. It's, uh, it's the same thing with that. But it's still quite good looking movie, yes. Audio. When I used to watch this movie, um, I always thought that the audio was more towards the front of you and not really anything around you. I was wrong. Um, there's a lot of stuff around you. It's just not overplayed, like, say, Star Trek 5. Our Star Trek 3 or Star Trek the motion picture was... I say Star Trek 6 actually had a lot of stuff around you all the time, too. This one does not, but um, when it does, it's very good and dramatic. But yes, a lot of stuff is in front of you, but that's okay with me. I don't mind having that as long as you have enough surround effects around you, and that's kind of the case with this movie. Um, well, that's pretty much my views on Star Trek Generations from 1994. Have you seen the movie? Did you like the movie? As always, subscribe. Support this channel. Um, share this video with friends. And I'll see you guys next time for my review of 1996's Star Trek First Contact. Until then.